welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Joseph Pierce. We're talking to him about his book, Through Shakespeare's Eyes, Seeing the Catholic Presence in the Plays, and it's published by Ignatius Press. And welcome, Joe. Great to have you here. And people might be looking and trying to figure out where exactly are we. Well, actually, we had a great opportunity while you were here when we were covering the Pope for his great visit to the U.K. a few weeks back. Uh, we had a great opportunity. You were here providing coverage along with Raymond DeRoy, and we said, you've got a new book. Here's a chance to get to talk to you. So we're right here on the set for our coverage from the Pope's visit. Thank you so much for finding the time. Oh, my pleasure. Now, Shakespeare seems to be something that you've had a focus on for a while. Obviously, people who watch EWTN know that we've shot a couple of series related to Shakespeare, a little different than this. What What is the series about? Well, actually, the, the first series I, I did for EWTN, The Quest for Shakespeare, Series 1, was based upon my first book, The Quest for Shakespeare, um, The Bard of Avon and the Church of Rome. And the second series, which I did for EWTN, The Quest for Shakespeare, Series 2, is based upon this book, mm -hmm. uh, Through Shakespeare's Eyes, Seeing the Catholic Presence in the Plays. Mm -hmm. And the first series basically was looking at the biographical and documentary evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism. And this second book is looking at the, the evidence for his Catholicism to be found in his plays, mm -hmm. so in the works themselves. Well, we've talked about this before, and certainly in, your, in your, your first book, The Quest for Shakespeare, there's a question about, you know, why does it matter whether Shakespeare was Catholic? And let's say for the sake of argument in reading through this book, one would say, okay, maybe Shakespeare was Catholic. But in, in, in going through your examples, and you talk about three main plays that you kind of focus on, here we'll talk about that. You know, in reading it as a casual reader, I certainly would have to admit it wouldn't jump out at me. Right. Did but, it jump out at you? <laughs> well, no, because I knew these plays uh, long before I saw this Catholic dimension in them. Um, and the reason, of course, that the Catholicism is more subtle than that is, first of all, that it was I illegal to be a Catholic when Shakespeare was writing. It was against the law. To be a priest was punishable by death. Mm -hmm. And there was also another law which said that it was also illegal to talk about contemporary religious and political topics. Okay. So Shakespeare, if he's going to, Shakespeare's going to bring his Catholicism into the plays, he has to do it with a subtlety. So, for instance, he sets the plays in the past, mm -hmm. which is Catholic, you, know, you only go back, go back 50, 60 years before Shakespeare and you have a Catholic England. Mm -hmm. You set them in the past, which is Catholic, or you set them in Italy, which is Catholic. Okay. And this is your excuse, bona fide excuse to have uh, you know, Franciscan friars and, mm -hmm. and people talking about the Mass and what have you. Why wouldn't that have been an issue for his audience at the time? Well, the, the, the thing you have to remember about Shakespeare's England, the Elizabethan England, um, and Jacobean England later, the, the uh, government was very opposed to Catholicism, but there were still many, many Catholics in England. Were. Exactly. A, a very large number of the people of England were still Catholics, certainly in spirit, and many of them were defiantly practicing in secret as well. Mm -hmm. And this would have comprised a, a, a considerable section of Shakespeare's audience. And the government, you know, although it had these laws, and although it cracked down very hard, particularly on priests, you know, it turned a blind eye to, mm -hmm. to, to, to an awful lot. So it wasn't that Shakespeare's Catholicism was not known. In my first book, there's a whole chapter showing how Shakespeare's Catholicism was known as the, Shakespeare, as the Catholicism of the, the court composer William Byrd's uh, was known, but that as long as Shakespeare didn't overstep the mark and didn't come out with uh, you know, what would be considered to be openly seditious mm -hmm. uh, pol politics against the state, you know, there was a blind eye turned. So Shakespeare had to walk this tightrope where he wanted to express his deepest held beliefs in his plays, which he does brilliantly, uh, but without going so far as to make it uh, so obvious that the play would be banned and he'd be thrown in prison. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, a de it's like walking a tightrope. It's a delicate balancing act. Now, you focus on three plays, um, uh, The Merchant of Venice, Hamlet, and King Lear. Now, did you focus on those because those have the most evidence for his Catholicism, or because they're the most well-known? Well, the latter, mostly. I thought if, if, you're, if you're going to make your case, you want to take some of the best-known plays. Mm -hmm. Um, and to show it's, it's in these plays because it, Shakespeare's Catholicism is going to be present in all the plays um, but I decided that you had to look at the plays in detail because one of the mistakes being made by other Catholic scholars of Shakespeare is they take one, one line from Act 1 of a play another line from Act 3 and another line from Act 5 and say look this proves his Catholicism mm -hmm. well it doesn't because you can say well what about this with the ha that happens in Act 2 and mm -hmm. Act 4 it's kind of like proof texting exactly mm -hmm. exactly so I thought no you have to go through methodically you have to go through scene by scene 
So that's what I've done. That's why the, the book only covers three plays, because I, I thought it important to go through in detail to make the case. And, and then when you do that, I think you can make it convincingly to such a degree that I, th I find it really hard to refute the, mm -hmm. the, the Catholics I mentioned in these plays. Now you mentioned, you alluded, you mentioned Elizabethan, you said Jacobean. What is Jacobean in Jacobean, uh, after Queen Elizabeth I died, um, James I came to the throne, and Jacobean is merely a word meaning uh, the, the reign of James right. from the Latin. Mm -hmm. So Jacobean is the reign. So Shakespeare was writing under th both those monarchies. Mm -hmm. uh, under the, his early plays were written during the, the late, the end of Queen Elizabeth I reign, and then his, his late plays were written at the beginning of James I's reign. Mm -hmm. Now you also talk about this. I remember in your in your other uh, volume you talked about things being objectively seen and subjectively seen. Right. And, and that's a major theme throughout your analysis of these plays. How so? Well, basically, we can either read the, read the plays um, through our own eyes, in which case what happens is that, uh, subjectively in other words, mm -hmm. what happens is we have our own prejudices reflected back to us. We get out of it what we can get out of it, and we don't learn from it. We really, it really just reflects ourselves. Or we can try to see the, the, the plays, and this applies to all works of literature, not just to Shakespeare's plays. We can either see the plays and the literature through the eyes of the author. Mm -hmm. And if you see the, eyes through the, the play through the eyes of the author, you're going to see the plays objectively. You know, the, the play as it is, as a work of art, which comes through the creative uh, um, faculties of, of, of one person. So you, you do see the personhood of the author in the work. And what aspect of the personhood is most, most powerful? Well, of course, their most deeply held beliefs which is their theology and their philosophy. So th there's, th uh, someone cannot avoid their theology and philosophy informing the work. So if, so if Shakespeare is a Catholic, and my first book proves that he is, uh, the second book is showing what if he's a Catholic, you know, we obviously we have to see the plays objectively mm -hmm. through his Catholic eyes. You know, uh, is, is, the, is this a Catholic work? If so, how? And that's what I try to do in, right, in, in the second book. Right, and that's the book, obviously. Yeah, exactly. All about that. Now you say, in seeing the plays through Shakespeare's eyes, we will be seeing one of the darkest periods in history illuminated by one of its greatest geniuses. I get the part about the great genius. Why do you describe this as one of the darkest periods? Well, it was a period in history of secular fundamentalism. The, 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 the Elizabethan and Jacobean state was basically Machiavellian. It was uh, um, secular to, to an extreme, so that the Catholicism, to actually practice the Catholic faith was illegal. To be a Catholic priest was punishable by death. Uh, there are 40 canonized martyrs of England and Wales, 85 beatified martyrs of England and Wales, and these were priests and laity who were put to, to death for the practice of the Catholic faith. So, you know, this is a period where, where the church was uh, literally uh, being not only persecuted, but persecuted to death. So mm -hmm. it's a bit like the early church and the martyrdom of the early church. It's almost like the, uh, the, the, the Roman persecution being revisited mm -hmm. in England. And this was the period in which Shakespeare was living and writing. Now, in, in the prologue through Shakespeare's eyes, you say every work of literature is the incarnation of the fruitful relationship between the artist and his muse. And you say, from a Christian perspective, the muse is the gift of grace. So what, is, what do you mean by that? Because you say from an atheist perspective, it is the author's subconscious. Yeah, the, the, the important thing here is that, that even atheists uh, agree that there's some sort of gift, some, something which is not conscious mm -hmm. that comes into the creative process. The, the pagans called it the muse, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of the creative gifts of the gods. Uh, Christians call it g grace, the, cr the, the created gift of grace. Uh, but even, uh, even atheists talk about, you know, it's in the subconscious. So the point is that everybody ex agrees there's something magical that happens. But the important thing is that whatever happens does not contradict the personhood mm -hmm. of the author. In other words, you're not possessed by this grace, so that you're sort of writing here like this, and you don't know what you're writing, and you read it back, and you completely disagree with it, mm -hmm. or don't understand it. It's, it is an expression of your personhood, which means your deepest held beliefs. So, you know, so an atheist, his atheism will be expressed in his work. A Catholic, his Catholicism will be expressed in his work. Mm -hmm. Now, let's start off with The Merchant of Venice, which is the first one you deal with, and you really spend more time on this play than any of the two others that you talk about in the book. Why? Well, for, for one thing, The Merchant of Venice is one of the plays, uh, probably the, the play of Shakespeare that's most abused mm -hmm. and misunderstood by mod so. modern audiences. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's been turned from a comedy. I mean, Shakespeare's play has basically three focal points, all of which uh, are, are profoundly Christian, ending with a happy ending. Mm -hmm. An ending actually on a very light and, and, and flippant note, but with a, an important meaning. 
modern, modern interpretations have turned it from the comedy of the Merchant of Venice into the tragedy of Shylock, mm -hmm. where the evil character of Shylock in the plays becomes the, the hero. Mm -hmm. um, and I liken it, in fact, to, uh, to Dickens. You know, if, if we see the, A Christmas Carol by Dickens... Right, talk about that in the book. Right? Yeah, right. if we see A Christmas Carol by Dickens and the, and the title's changed to Scrooge, mm -hmm. we're not too offended, because, let's face it, the book's about Scrooge. Mm -hmm. But if you saw Oliver Twist and, 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 and the title uh, 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 of that was Fagin, or the tragedy of Fagin, and Fagin becomes the central character, you'd see a violation done mm -hmm. to the integrity of Dickens's novel. Well, this is basically exactly what's being done with The Merchant of Venice by making Shylock the central focus and the central figure. Well, he's presented uh, as if he's the title character in many ways and, people talk about. And the hero, where he's, cer the he's, he's certainly a villain. And, and, and the reason is, of course, because we, we, it, it's considered that Fagin is, is uh, um, a, a Jewish victim of anti-Semitism. But I show in my book that this is not anti-Semitism. First of all, Shakespeare um, condemns... Um, We're talking about Shylock here. Right? Yeah, Shakespeare yeah. condemns Shylock for his usury, first mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. which is condemned by Catholicism, but sanctioned by Calvinism. Yeah. Okay. Um, and th really, that Shylock, two things. He's a villain because he's a usurer, first of all. And that he, means he was charging what? Interest He was charging loans, excessive, money, immoral interest on loans, which was, which was uh, an act which was... For, forbidden by the church, was condemned by the philosophers such as St. Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. uh, and was the official position of the church. Mm -hmm. Whereas Calvin had said it was okay, the usury is okay. There were no Jews in England at all in Shakespeare's time. They'd been expelled 300 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So Sha Shakespeare knew no, didn't know Jews. Mm -hmm. But Puritans were the, were the usurers. Uh, because Shakespeare's not allowed to talk about contemporary politics, okay. because of the law that, f that forbids it, he uses a Jew... As the, f as, as the front, if you like, the cardboard cutout for the Puritan. And, his, and Shakespeare's audience, when they think of usurers, they thought of Puritans. Mm -hmm. So for his audience, we're talking about a Puritan. And you think that's how they actually saw it when they went to see it? That's oh, absolutely. how they interpreted it? Absolutely. So it's not that you're reading that back into it today? No, because I say, usury was, had returned to the, to, to the English economy because of Calvinism. Uh, and the Calvinists were the usurers. And the other thing is, we, the, 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 it's not anti-Semitic, because I'll give you a perfect example. When Shylock's daughter becomes uh, a Christian, uh, she's welcomed with, 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 with open arms and open hearts, and it's said that she has no more in common with Shylock than, no, the, 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 than anything else. So, so um, the connection is not racial. And the analogy I think of is if, if a member of the Ku Klux Klan married a, a black woman, um, would the, the other members of the Klan say, well, that's fine, she's an honorary member of the Klan now because you married her? But this is what happens in, 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 in Merchant of Venice, that uh, uh, a, a Jewish woman marries a Christian. She's accepted and embraced with uh, open arms. So the question is one of theology, mm -hmm. not of race. Not of race. Okay. So, you know, the, the, all of these things are very important for us to understand and, and, and uh, alas and unfortunately not understood by modern producers of the play. Well, you say many of the mistakes made about the play have been the result of seeing the Jew and not the Jesuit. Who's the Jesuit? Right. There's a subtext in the work which is uh, shown by the fact that Shakespeare uses references to the poetry of St. Robert Southall, mm -hmm. a Jesuit priest that Shakespeare almost definitely knew well for, for evidence which I set out in this book, but more so in my first book. Mm -hmm. uh, and his po Southall's poetry is represented throughout, the, uh, throughout this play. And the central scene uh, of the, uh, uh, of, um, uh, um, at the beginning of the play of the caskets uh, where the correct choice is to choose death, not, not to choose gold, not to choose silver, not to choose the worldly comforts, mm -hmm. but to embrace death. Um, and this is the correct choice which wins the, the, the bride. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the ecclesiology which Shakespeare uses in his plays, the bridegroom and bride, Christ and the church, as it is, you know, we see it also in King Lear. Mm -hmm. um, that the subtext here is laying down your life for your friends, laying down your life for your faith, which, of course, Robert Southall, who Shakespeare probably knew as a friend, had done in 1595, uh, about the time this play was being written, was hanged, worn, and quartered for being a Catholic priest. So his presence is palpable uh, subtextually in the play. And the other one was Lopez also? Yes. Well, Lopez was, was, was uh, um, a, a Jewish member of, uh, of Queen Elizabeth's court who was accused of spying for the King of Spain. Right? He, was he, was, he was a convert to, to Christianity. Mm -hmm. He was accused of spying and was also uh, hanged one a quarter. So these two, these two executions mm -hmm. were the backdrop to, 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 to much of this play. Mm -hmm.
So that's, that's the Catholic subtext that you say. Exactly. In one. And also you say, and it kind of fits in, you say the heroes are demonized and its villains are lionized by the way it's seen today. Exactly. The whole thing has been inverted and perverted so that the villains such as Shylock have become the heroes. Now, I'll give you an example. This is a practical example. I saw a, a performance of the, the Merchant of Venice at a, in a theater in England, and all of the Christian characters were skinheads. And in between, in between the lines of the play, they would spit at Shylock and kick him. Now, no lines of the play have been changed, but the whole meaning of the play has been turned inside out. And it's also, too, you, this was interesting, you know, the, the character of Portia, who, you know, uh, people know. You say uh, in here, in describing Portia as the most blessed of all earthly women, who has no equal in virtue anywhere in this poor, rude world, Shakespeare is clearly casting Portia as a Marian figure. Right. In The Merchant of Venice, there were, there were two realms, Belmont, the beautiful mountain, which is mystical, time seems to stand still there, it's the place of virtue, the place which is a largely sin sinless environment, and Venice, which is venial, and uh, it's a place where, where, where sinners and, and the worldly-minded and the greedy, you know, fight each other. And it's the perspective of the two places. How do you see reality from the worldly perspective, um, such as Shylock? Or how, how do you see reality from the, uh, the beautiful vision of the spiritual, which is Portia's view? Mm -hmm. um, so you have this magical realm, and it is a spiritual realm, Belmont. It's, it's a, like a magical fairyland place. So you have this spiritual dimension. So to see Portia, and of course one of Our Lady's uh, um, titles is Gate of Heaven. Um, right, and you make that connection with her name, exactly. right? Exactly, Por Portia from Porta, Latin for gate. Mm -hmm. So also you say here, talking about the critics, again, the way they look at it today, lacking perspective, these critics are left with nothing but the perplexity that leads to apoplexy. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, apart, apart from the, 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 the fun it's of a cute pl pl sentence, pl right, playing right, words. Right, right. Um, well, the, 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 tr the trouble is that the, really the modern critics, when you uh, confront them with the deeply Christian, orthodox nature of Shakespeare's plays are rendered apoplectic. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are angered by it, they don't want Shakespeare to be what they don't want him to be, and they're much more comfortable with their subjective readings, where they see what they want to see and ignore what they don't want to see, or turn things inside out, then you're showing to them, no, this is what, clearly what Shakespeare means, and you make all the connections. And it, to, to have an orthodox Catholic Shakespeare is something which the secular academy, who love their Shakespeare, mm -hmm. that is not the real Shakespeare, it's merely a figment of their imaginations. This is a threat to them, quite frankly. And you're saying throughout this that the audience at the time would have seen it the way you're presenting Shakespeare's vision. Of. Precisely. And we, we do need to see that. You don't just see the play through Shakespeare's eyes. You have to see it also as far as possible through the eyes of his time. You say, unable to accept virtue when they see it. I thought that was interesting. The postmodern critic denies it and defames it by turning every virtuous word and action into a cynical lie on the hero's or heroine's part. What do you mean? The actions, the, the, the trial, et cetera, the things yeah, that they what, actually do? What they say, when, when people act virtuously, um, the way that they poison it is by making the whole thing de to descend to the level of irony. So I'll give an example. Uh, they, with the, 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 the casket scene, mm -hmm. Portia's love for Bassanio. Modern producers have Portia and Bassanio cheating. Mm -hmm. And it's not in the text. In fact, it's emphatic, and I show it some length in my, in my book. It's not in the text. There's no evidence whatsoever mm -hmm. for cheating. In fact, on the contrary, all the text shows the opposite, that, that Portia has great pains to make sure it's, everything's done the way it should be, mm -hmm. correctly. But they make, they, make, they make them cheat. So, of course, it, the, the whole nobility of of Bassanio choosing death, mm -hmm. laying down his life for his love to actually mm -hmm. be worthy of that love is lost because they both right. cynically cheated. And you, and you also make a connection to the, to the Magi there too, don't you, with the, the caskets with... Right, and basically this is a revelation, a revelation, a revelation of Christ to the Gentiles. And you know, the gold, silver, myrrh, gold, silver, myrrh of course represents death. Mm -hmm. So gold, silver, lead, the lead in the play represents death. So yes, there is a connection. Now, you also say that Shylock stands for the law and the judgment that demands an eye for an eye, in a sense that Shylock stands for the old law and the old judgment. And you think that's the case that Shakespeare's made? Yes. In the trial scene, the principal issue is between justice and mercy. Uh, Portia is the voice of mercy, and therefore the voice of Christianity and the voice of, uh, of, the, of the new law. Uh, and uh, Shylock is the voice of 
demanding justice. And of course, the whole point is, be careful about demanding justice. Because you know, if, you, if you're demanding justice instead of mercy, then you'll be judged as you are judged. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happens to Shylock. He's judged uh, as ruthlessly and mercilessly as he is demanding that others should be judged. So you know, at the words of Christ, judge not lest you be judged. I mean, that's the, the whole uh, moral dynamic of the trial scene in, in Merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. Now, Hamlet, you go on and you, you, you talk about Hamlet. Ha why is what happens in Hamlet so Catholic? Well, Hamlet's a conversion story. Mm -hmm. Now, Hamlet begins as someone who is tempted to despair, tempted to doubt, um, and ends by saying um, that, it ends in joy by saying there's not a sparrow that falls from heaven mm -hmm. that our Lord does not know about. Uh, alluding directly to scripture to the gospels and, and saying that the readiness is all that he's come to a, an acceptance of uh, the truth he also accepts the witness of his father who's a catholic in purgatory mm -hmm. um, at first he doubts him um, but comes to see that the ghost is honest uh, and so the catholic the catholic spiritual character in it the, the soul in purgatory mm -hmm. is the honest one that gives us insights and, and exposes the murder and the uh, and because of the understanding of like purgatory and, and the spirit, that would also put it in, a, in an opposite pr perspective from a Protestant view of it, right? Because of the non-purgatory and exactly, of course, that purgatory book. was 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 was, was uh, ex excluded from Protestantism as a doctrine, and also that the uh, Protestants believed that uh, all ghosts were were demonic. Uh, where Catholics believe that no, the ghosts c could be suffering spirits, suffering souls. So Shakespeare takes the Catholic position on ghosts, and this is very topical. Mm -hmm. time. King James the First had actually written a book called Demonology, uh, talking about all of this. Mm -hmm. So it's very topical at the time. Shakespeare takes the Catholic position and not the Protestant one, again, very, mm -hmm. very significantly. A and as a, a big old movie fan who loved Errol Flynn, I noticed the Earl of Essex is mentioned here, and we, we all remember Elizabeth and Essex, the particular movie, but in reality, somehow there was a connection between Shakespeare's view of Essex and how Hamlet is written out. What's yeah. the connection? Well, Hamlet finds himself basically the victim of injustice. Um, uh, his father... Um, murders, sorry, his uncle murders his father and then marries his mother. Um, and so he finds himself embroiled in all this and in one of his famous soliloquies he says, you know, how, how do we respond to this? Do we suffer in silence or do we, do we take up arms? Mm -hmm. um, and this of course is the, 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 the issue that all Catholics faced at the time is do you suffer in silence stoically or do you take up arms for justice? And of course, the, the Earl of Essex and his es the Essex Rebellion in 1601 rose up, uh, and it's, there's circumstantial evidence that Shakespeare was sympathetic to that uprising, as were most Catholics. Because he promised toleration of Catholicism, though he wasn't Catholic himself. Exactly, Essex. and Queen Elizabeth and the first... neither is Hamlet in a play Catholic. He's clearly not Catholic. Well, I except he becomes Catholic. Right. That's the whole point, because he's he his father's Catholic. He, he realizes that, that uh, his father's ghost is honest, mm -hmm. that the world in which he lives is dishonest. You know, his Protestant friends such as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern turn out to be spies. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end, we have this conversion. Um, for, you know, after the graveyard scene, which is a long memento more, a reminder of death, uh, and that's the reminder of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So, you know, he, he's a conversion from a, a, a Protestant skeptic to a believing Catholic. This is the story of Hamlet. And let's just touch on King Lear. What, what's the, why King Lear? Well, again, this really sets the scene for the situation that Catholics found themselves in England, where the king, the monarch, was demanding all the love of the subjects, even above their love of God, because they had to uh, swear that they accepted the king or the queen as the head of the church. Um, so at the beginning of the play, King Lear demands, tell me how much you love me and I'll give you uh, you know, a third of my kingdom. And the, the daughter who really loves him refuses to play the game. Mm -hmm. She says, love and be silent, she says. Because she, she says to him, I can only give you that love which is due to you. Mm -hmm. I can't give you the love which is not due to you. What about when I marry? And again, you know, the ecclesiological imagery, bridegroom and bride, you, could, you can only give so much, so much of your loyalty to the state. Right. Now, if, 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 when the state is demanding that you cannot practice your faith, then you, you have to love and be silent. But, but just before we go, I hear these things and I say they're, they're Christian insights, but are they explicitly Catholic insights? Well, an Anglican wouldn't have to worry about it because Anglicanism was the, the established state religion. Uh, we read 
King Lear we reminded of St Thomas More who loved and was silent and was put to death mm -hmm. for remaining silent uh, refusing to uh, accept the oath so uh, this is something which is very again very very palpable very poignant right. to the Catholics of the time okay and just before we go another book on Shakespeare or another book in general <laughs> well I've written a book on, 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 on uh, the orthodoxy of Romeo and Juliet so there is another book of Shakespeare another out there. Book out there, but also uh, we've got a wonderful series which will continue here on EWTN, The Quest for Shakespeare, as uh, we thank you so much, Joe Pierce, for thank giving you. us a few minutes while you came here during the papal cover, speaking here with the author, Joseph Pierce, of Through Shakespeare's Eyes, Seeing the Catholic Presence in the Plays, published by Ignatius Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.